Good morning. I'm Leinani Walter. I'm the Chief Equity Officer here at the Department of Developmental Services. Good morning. I'm Dr. Lauren Libero. I'm the Autism Specialist at DDS. Today we'll be speaking about service access and equity initiatives and updates in the Department of Developmental Services. No disclosures? In 2017, we worked with our federal partners to develop this vision statement to create transformational changes towards a culturally and linguistically competent developmental service system. This statement is really has been our guiding force in the last several years to help our system to become more equitable. It's been our guiding light and we're looking forward to continuing to update and develop policies that reflect this vision. Currently, 388,000 total individuals receive services through the California Regional Center System. Approximately 47,000 children ages 0 to 36 months are served through our federal Early Start program, which is represented by the red bar on the graph. And 340,000 individuals uh, currently receive services through uh, the Lanterman Act. Um, these are all of the bars in orange. You see they span the entire lifespan. Um, currently, within um, our Lanterman Services Program, intellectual disability makes up our largest share of individuals at 54%. Uh, however, autism is our fastest growing category, uh, currently with 44% of our population. Um, but when we take a look at all of our children ages 0 to 21, autism makes up 60% uh, of those served. And around 20% of the children who participate in Early Start uh, transition to lifelong Lanterman services. And we typically expect um, that transition to happen seamlessly by age three. However, that transition doesn't always happen uh, quite so smoothly. And what we found is during the COVID-19 pandemic, inequities in access to services were magnified. And uh, this was especially the case for individuals accessing the regional center system for the very first time. Um, so in response, one major change that DDS enacted last year was uh, what we're calling provisional eligibility for children ages three and four. So moving on, um, this was an important step in capturing children during uh, critical developmental ages and ensuring continuity of support. And this also represents the first major change to our eligibility criteria for Lanterman services since the inception of the Lanterman Act. So Leinani, we can go ahead and move on. So um, why did we end up making this um, pretty large change? Well, our DDS data indicates that there are children uh, that age out of the Early Start program by age three, um, and they exit the system and re-enter uh, later on. And that means there's children who have disabilities, uh, but are not being fully recognized around age uh, two years, nine months, which is typically when those assessments for Lanterman services are conducted. So let's take a look at the data um, that shows this. So on our next slide here, this is a data analysis we looked at um, to try to see how the transition uh, was occurring for children in early start. And what we did was we took a look at all children ages five to 10 as of January, 2020, so pre-pandemic, we had 63,049 children who were ages five to 10 uh, who were uh, eligible for Lanterman services um, in all of our diagnostic categories. When we looked back in time at those children uh, to see how many of those children participated in early start, and then did they have a seamless transition uh, from early start to Lanterman services if they did, uh, we actually uncovered 8.1% of all of our children um, participated in early start, but then exited the system at three, uh, later re-entering. So uh, 5,110 children experienced that, that delay um, between early start and Lanterman. And digging a little bit deeper into uh, the children that experienced that gap uh, in services, um, we found 53.5% of them uh, experienced that exit from the system because they were determined not eligible for Lanterman Act services. 
40% of them exited after early start because the family never completed the eligibility process. And then um, just 6% uh, were coded as other. Um, so they dropped out of our system, but we don't quite know why. Um, so why would 53.5% of these children um, who really did have an eligible disability, why would they be determined not eligible for services at three? Um, well, there's a few clinical challenges um, that occur around that time. Um, so one example would be um, it may be difficult to uh, finalize a diagnosis of a disability by the end of the second year of life. Uh, another um, challenging aspect um, is determining whether a three-year-old child meets the functional limitations that are required uh, as criteria for Lannerman services. So for example, a clinician might be looking at a three-year-old uh, and they're trying to determine, does this three-year-old have the capacity for independent living? Uh, and that's a really hard determination to make uh, at that developmental point. Um, so uh, those are two uh, clinical reasons um, that we might be seeing children being determined ineligible at that age. Uh, and then we may also have an intersection um, between those clinical challenges and some potential cultural biases or challenges that come in um, for children who are non-English speaking um, being assessed uh, with traditional clinical tools. Uh, and in this analysis, we did find that there were children from some ethnic groups that were more likely than the statewide average to be determined not eligible for services at three. Um, this included children who identified as Vietnamese, Korean, Chinese, Hispanic, or multiple ethnicities. And I'd also like to mention this pattern of exiting early start and then later re-entering was most common for children who ultimately received a diagnosis of autism. And historically, we have studies that show children who are uh, Black or African American or Hispanic uh, tend to have a delayed diagnosis of autism. So that may also be a factor at play here. So in an effort to ensure um, that children are experiencing a continuity of services during these critical developmental years, we introduced uh, provisional eligibility in July of 2021. So let's take a look at our provisional eligibility side by side with our Lanterman Act criteria. Um, and for your review or your reference, I have these on the next slide. Uh, and the main differences here are for provisional eligibility, um, it's limited to children who are three and four years of age, um, whereas the Lanterman Act eligibility is for any age. Uh, and provisional eligibility, a child does not have to have a formal diagnosis of a developmental disability, and they only have to meet on two of the functional limitations instead of three. Um, but for both categories, a child does not have to have participated in early start services uh, to qualify. And for both of these categories, the services are going to be the same, the services that are described in the Lanterman Act. Now, before I move on, I do also want to note um, in our data analysis, we did find about 40% of the children that it that gap between early start and Lanterman services exited because the family never completed the eligibility process. So I really wanna highlight the important role that clinicians play, uh, not only in early identification of our kiddos, but also supporting parents um, who have concerns, uh, making sure that those parents get referred to the regional centers um, and making sure uh, that the parents are able to follow through with the process. Uh, they feel supported through the process and that those families know that they are allowed to return to the regional center later on even if they're determined ineligible or if they drop out of the process and don't finish it um, at, a, at a specific time. Okay, another recent initiative that DDS introduced to address inequities around clinical assessments is our implicit bias training, which Leinani is going to speak to now. Yes, this is one of our new policy initiatives that was put forward in conversations with our African-American community. Um, coming together with our leadership group. This was one of the ideas that comes from that community engagement. Implicit bias um, training, of course, raises awareness of unconscious biases, and it, it helps us to improve, to think about our own biases through our own experiences. Regional center eligibility, as Lauren just spoke about, 
is the first step in our developmental system. Implicit bias training is just one way, it's one strategy that clinicians and regional centers can take to learn new ways to address their biases and to make sure that they're making a fair decision. Um, this new policy will be implemented for all case management clinicians, as well as contractors doing intake in our system. So it's, it's, um, we're in the process of going through the contract process and um, looking forward to developing this training more with um, our partners with input from our stakeholders. Lauren? One metric for service access that we have been tracking for several years is purchase of service dollars, um, which is uh, dollars spent directly for the purchase of service for an individual. And we've been looking at how many people have what we would describe as low purchase of service, which is defined as less than $2,000 uh, purchase of service in a year, or individuals who have no purchase of service, so $0 within a year, even though those individuals are eligible for services. And this graph illustrates the proportion of children that have low or no purchase of service by ethnicity. And this is compared to the statewide average um, percentage of low or no POS for all ages, um, which are those two horizontal bars across the graph. Uh, and you can see the share of children that have no purchase of service, which is the orange bars, is actually lower than the statewide average for all groups and ages. Um, and the, um, the share of children that have low purchase of service, which is in blue, um, all groups except other are lower than the statewide average. Um, so in general, we're seeing for children, um, the low and no purchase of service um, shares are, are lower than average. However, uh, children may still experience inequity, even if the shares are less than the statewide average for all ages. Um, for example, we see children in the other group are um, experiencing twice the proportion of children who have low purchase of service compared to uh, white children. It's also important to examine um, qualitative measures and other complementary methods to see the whole picture of an individual's experience with access to service. Um, so for example, some individuals may be in an area where they have greater access to generic services, or they may have very good private insurance that's covering a lot of services for them, or they may access lots of services through their school district. Um, but this is one metric um, that does give us a picture of how much access an individual has to regional center services specifically. And um, one highlight from our 2021 budget was the introduction of enhanced service coordination for individuals who have this low or no purchase of service pattern to increase access to services and supports. So Leinani, let's take a look at the next slide. Now this program, this is gonna reduce the caseload for service coordinators um, to a one to 40 ratio uh, to support uh, up to 4,200 individuals statewide um, to ensure that they have um, adequate service coordination, uh, increased access to service, um, and to try to build communication and trust within the system. Include uh, beyond just their purchases of, of purchase of service. Um, we're also going to be looking at outcome measures, you know, like um, does this family feel uh, supported by the regional center? Um, are they satisfied with the types of services that they're accessing, not just the purchase of service? Um, and those outcome measures are going to be defined in collaboration with the regional centers. And this is an expansion of a very effective model that was developed out of Eastern Los Angeles Regional Center um, that was created through uh, funding by a 2017 DDS Service Access and Equity Grant. And Leinani is gonna share more about our Service Access and Equity Grant program. As Lauren was sharing, um, East Los Angeles was part of the Service Access and Equity Grant program and proved to be an incredibly successful model one of DDS's important building blocks for system change in the last five years has been the Service Access and Equity Grant Program. It serves as an incubator for creative ideas for diverse communities and has set the foundation for a number of policy initiatives that we'll be talking about today. Just to highlight a couple of the seeds for change that have been in the grant program. The focus this year, every year, we have guidelines that to help to tailor some of our stakeholder input, 
community-based organization input on prioritization. This year and the last several years has been a focus on early start. But some of the new focus in this last year has also been tribal engagement with our Native American communities, a focus on the deaf and hard of hearing community and those resources that are necessary, and also culturally responsive behavioral health. Those are different um, aspects that we often overlook in looking at our entire system. So this grant program allows us to really prioritize and target a particular area. And I always like to say um, our grants are really seeds for change. And I really do mean that because our grants have provided us information in a small community, for example, the Hmong community or Cambodian community, or small pockets and focusing on black infant health. Some of these initiatives not only have taught us and you know, helped us to learn, but have helped to expand this knowledge to other communities statewide. For this year, um, just giving you a small sense of some of our clinical focused grant projects, um, our CHLA project or Children's Hospital of Los Angeles has been one of our most successful projects working with community navigators, which I'll be speaking about as a statewide project, but it is really from some of these projects that we learn so much more about how to reach communities that we are not doing, it, we are not able to do in a very targeted, purposeful way. So <clears throat> for example, the uh, Korean Special Education Center, Kasich, not only helps us with early intervention and advocacy, but help to translate those important materials that Lauren was speaking about, helping families get to the evaluation. There's a lot that goes on before a family reaches the assessment team, the assessment process. And some of the work that Kasich has done has been incredible with not only helping families to understand with culturally competent materials, but actually working with a family to get them to the assessment. And we have heard time and time again from our regional centers, from our clinicians, that having that community-based navigator help a family get to a, a, an assessment has improved. And in one instance recently, um, I was told over 90% of show. So in other words, in out of 100 you know, children with community-based organization help, it's 90%. Without that help, it's 20%. I think that's really critical to understand because so we serve such a diverse community. We have to ensure we have bilingual clinicians. As Dr. Hutro, you know, so eloquently put so many important topics, having bilingual clinicians that are able to understand not only by language, but help families to understand what the process is like. Some of these opportunities have happened, of course, with UCI Irvine Health, um, virtual developmental screenings. During the pandemic, many children and families were not able to reach and to get some of those developmental screenings. This was a model the opportunity to be able to still access clinicians. Um, and of course, we, we have a number of regional centers um, conducting developmental screenings and Orange County is one of those examples, partnering with CBOs with multi, you know, multilingual um, clinicians that offer and go into a community that they often would, so they take the assessments into the community rather having families make their way to a localized office. I think these are excellent models for how we need to strategize to reach our diverse populations. The Community Navigator Program, as I just spoke about, is now a statewide program. We're so thankful to be partnering with our family resource centers statewide, having a Community Navigator Program in all 21 regional centers. And I think a, an important highlight is this it is a strategy that's not been implemented just in our grant program. It's the community healthcare worker model. It's a model that's been successful across the country. Ways that we try to reach families with navigators with lived experience. Not only do they speak the same language, but these are parents. These are mentors. These are people that families can reach to very comfortably without feeling like they need to go to a government to get information. They can work with a navigator to shepherd them through the process. Um, this is a model that we are, we are really excited 
Um, family resource centers have been trusted partners in the community, both with regional centers, as well as with families. So implementing the statewide model with already trusted partners is really something that we're excited about at the department. Our tribal outreach initiative um, near and dear to my heart has been um, an initiative that we are focused particularly on Native American children in the Early Start program with Early Start Services. Um, a little bit of background on this initiative. We took a look at the data. This was highlighted from some of our um, California Family Tribal Coalition leaders that we weren't reaching our tribal communities. We looked at the data and we saw that um, Native American children were least likely to have a funded service or to be served in the regional center. Um, in addition, that this particular group had fallen in terms of intake in the last three years. And given this data, um, the department requested additional resources. So again, we are so um, uh, privileged and honored to be working with tribal leaders through the California Family Tribals Coalition for a statewide initiative that'll be focused solely on early start. And our hope is that this will expand. But some of the components would be partnering with three key lead regional centers at San Diego, Kern, and Far Northern Regional Center. Those partners will be working with CTFC to implement not just outreach and training, development of a tribal engagement guide, in addition to culturally competent materials. Um, the things that we heard in early listening sessions with our tribal leaders and chairpersons is that many families aren't even aware of our system. So how can they get to an assessment if they don't even know that the system is available to them? And I think that's when we take a step back and we say, it's not just the brochure, it's actually going into communities and helping people um, from native communities understand that we're here and what those services are. So I think that we have to think about the way we reach communities is engaging not just the old fashioned way of giving a brochure, but actually spending the time. So part of this initiative will be hosting listening sessions. So before we begin sharing what we know, we wanna know what they know about us and what they need from us. And I think that this is a culturally competent model that we're hoping that will be um, not only implemented statewide, but will be part of our engagement efforts with Native American communities. Deaf and hard of hearing resources, there's a number of strategies that we are um, implementing with the deaf and hard of hearing resources statewide. So um, deaf specialists will be part of our system at all 21 regional centers. This is um, very exciting for regional centers, for the department and for our deaf and hard of hearing community to be able to have someone at the regional center at the local level to be able to connect with and help um, families uh, navigate deaf and hard of hearing services in our system. Our hope is that um, with bringing on a DDS, um, deaf access specialist soon, that will also provide some statewide leadership to engaging with our deaf and hard of hearing advocates and communities and stakeholder groups. In addition, ad additional resources for um, assessments. Um, many uh, identify as utilizing ASL in our system, but a larger, much larger number are part of the deaf and hard of hearing community that don't utilize ASL. And I have been uh, reminded and taught that it, culturally, ASL is an American sign language. We have a number of culturally diverse communities that don't utilize ASL. They use other forms um, from their own cultural community. So it's just important to look at the the deaf community is also culturally diverse and also understand the ethnic backgrounds and the experience they have as part of our informing of our system. So we're really so excited about uh, opportunities to work with the deaf and hard of hearing, but also learning, learning what the needs are of this community. Lauren? So families who have a child with a recent diagnosis of a developmental disability often face um, immediate and also potentially lifelong toxic stress that can impact uh, the family's mental health and can threaten the stability of the family unit. 
Um, and this can be related to learning how to care for uh, developmental or medical needs, stress over navigating complex systems of care, uh, concerns about financial responsibilities. Um, and we saw this was uh, particularly exacerbated by the pandemic. And in response to this um, and using funding from the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, DDS is gonna be piloting a family wellness pilot program. Uh, and this is uh, aimed particularly at uh, preventing negative health or wellness outcomes for families um, preventing uh, adverse childhood experiences and family crises. And this program is uh, going to have a specific focus on developing culturally and linguistically sensitive and effective uh, services and will be at no cost to families. Uh, and this is currently in the planning stages uh, in collaboration with the regional centers. Then another program that was included in the American Rescue Plan Act is our coordinated family support services. And uh, what we've seen in our, our DDS data is a trend uh, over time with more individuals remaining in the family home into adulthood. And we see pretty substantial differences in the proportion of individuals living in the family home when we look across racial and ethnic groups with uh, non-white individuals being far more likely to live in the family home than white individuals. And further, our data shows that individuals who live outside the family home have more coordinated services and access to services than individuals who live within the family home. So this program is gonna be a service that is uh, aimed at assisting individuals and their families uh, in accessing uh, coordinated and effective supports in home uh, with a focus on service equity and expanding our culturally and linguistically competent services and supports and increasing access to those supports and services in home. And we have so many other equity related initiatives um, this year that if we had time to share, we would, but we wanted to note that multiple policy equity initiatives have been driven by stakeholder input and data. Um, bilingual pay, I just wanna highlight a couple. Bilingual pay differential, such it, it doesn't sound as exciting as some of our other initiatives, but it is so critical. Um, it, it increases the choice for families. We often hear this from some of our um, Asian community and our Cantonese speaking community and Vietnamese that families want respite providers that speak their own language. Welcoming someone into your home that who doesn't speak your language is not something that's optimum. And many families decline a service because they don't have someone from their culture or community. So bilingual pay differential it is the hope that we can increase some of the capacity in our system. And language access and cultural competency, an opportunity for not only increasing translation, the things that we might need, but also offering the opportunity for orientations in native languages, for offering some consistency in um, translation and interpretation, the opportunity for a, this additional funding um, will help us to be a more accessible system to communities that speak other language and also for those who, who require plain language. Um, my brother is served in the system and he is a person that would require plain language access. I think it's always important to look at our self-advocate community and ensure that the materials that we have for them are also accessible. And so language access and cultural um, competency, those resources that are being put in that annually um, is a really a important aspect of service access and equity. And community engagement. It's a good way to end our conversation with you today. Building trust with diverse communities has truly been at the heart of all of the work that we have put forward in, in service access and equity in the last year. Um, part of the silver or gold lining, honestly, of the pandemic has been forming the African-American focus group, having the opportunity to hear directly to the department. And this group includes regional centers. It includes leaders from our service provider community. It includes families and family resource centers. So we have a diverse vision coming from that group, but also reminding us a number of things that Lauren and Dr. Hutro have said, basic needs. 
many of our conversations that we've had with the Latinx community and in our early tribal engagement has been, we can't get to an assessment until we have food in our belly, quality housing, ensuring that our families, when the, when the pandemic started, didn't have jobs. And the immediate need was for food. The immediate need was for masks and um, things related to and needs for the pandemic. We worked with our community-based organizations to ensure some of those resources can get to our families directly. Um, working with regional centers, CBOs work partnered with regional centers to ensure that they um, are receiving and connecting to those small indigenous communities um, in Mixteco communities on our coastal areas. Working with um, our number of CBOs with our community-based organizations and our cultural specialists. These conversations occur monthly for the department. So again, when we, we used to have opportunities and have large meetings, now we've narrowed those opportunities to have focused conversation. They're meaningful. They have moved a department, they have moved a state to think differently about how we serve people. And our hope is that this vision of ensuring that our system is more accessible and diverse, not only in our policies, but in the way we engage with people. So I, I hope that this information has been helpful. Uh, we have some resources and links here on Early Start and of course, Regional Center Eligibility, as well as our grant program. And you can look and see the grants that have been awarded, the new grants this year, and get a sense of uh, the work that's been done by our community partners and how much we have still yet to learn and how much work we still have to do. And we so appreciate your time today. <music>